In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We, um, we spoke yesterday... We spoke yesterday about the sin of laziness. And we said that sometimes when we bury our talents and we put things aside, that um, it becomes a huge waste of our lives, and especially that God gives us those talents to do something with. Because we all fit within an integral picture, and we all play a part within that picture. Now what we're going to speak about this morning is actually almost the opposite. And that is, yesterday we spoke about the sin of laziness. Today we want to speak about the sin of busyness. So, yesterday it was about sitting back, doing nothing, not wanting to be involved, being negative, being counterproductive, just being lazy. Today is quite the opposite. What happens when I'm doing too much? And if we assess the situation, too much will depend on, uh, it usually comes from two sources. Either I just drive myself too hard and I want to accomplish too much, or I am driven too hard because I need to accomplish too much. And so whether the source is internal or external, the result is, is pretty much the same. Um, all of you who do things that you're passionate about, um, work, studies, family, commitments, service, all of those things, you will realize that work in itself can become addictive. So, you know, we all worry, talk about addictions, we talk about addictive substances. And addictive substances, whether it's alcohol, drugs, even food, they can become addictive in themselves because you become dependent on them for a certain outcome. So why does someone have an addiction? Uh, because if they have this addiction, then they use a substance to get a certain result. So for instance, if they like the buzz that the drugs give them, they will take that drug for that buzz. If they like the feeling that the alcohol gives them, they will take that alcohol for that feeling. If they want the sense of fulfillment or accomplishment through food, it is that food for that accomplishment or, or, or that feeling or sensation. And so the addiction is really using something to gain a certain sensation or sense within ourselves. And sometimes work becomes that quote-unquote substance. Because sometimes work in itself becomes a driving force in our lives. Sometimes it becomes in itself the only sense of accomplishment. And so you get the, you know, and this is terminology of the 20th century, workaholics. And while it's a term we use quite regularly, and it's something we're used to hearing, when you actually think of the root of the word, being a workaholic, like being an alcoholic, it's exactly the same. It is the dependence on something, in this case work, to give us a desired sensation. And those workaholics work because the sensation for them sometimes is acceptance, sometimes is success, sometimes it's promotion, sometimes it is a sense of satisfaction that nothing else can give them. And you'll tend to find workaholics, therefore, are people who, using you know, metaphor, put all their eggs in one basket. All their sense of accomplishment comes from work. All their sense of satisfaction comes from work. And that's why they are more than happy then to dedicate 150% of themselves and of their time to work. And even that sometimes is 
not deemed enough. Again, sometimes it is because that internally is what makes me feel good, but sometimes it's because that's what the world puts on me. And you know, as much as we critique it, as much as we make jokes about it, sometimes we like the image of the suit-clad running executive with a bag over the shoulder and a coffee in one hand running because you can't make it on time. It gives a sense of importance. It's, it's what gives people a sense of, hey, I'm important. And if you look at the city, you know, if wherever you're from here in the States, I don't think when you look at the central, sit, central business district, it's going to be very different to what it is in London. And you, you go into the central business district and you see people in very similar suits, very stylish, but very similar, with very similar dress sense, depending on the current fashion, carrying very similar bags. So at one stage it was the, you know, the square, the rectangular briefcase, and then came in the scruffy leather bag, and then came in the worn scruffy leather bag, so you would you know, sandpaper down certain areas, and then came the vintage look, then came rucksacks, which I thought always looked very odd, very smartly dressed gentlemen and ladies in very, you know, in, in very exclusive suits carrying rucksacks. Why do you carry rucksacks? Because everyone else does. Because it gives me the image of being the executive who also goes to the gym. Right? Then you get these people who get on trains and they will carry their gym bags that have their sandwiches in them and they have no intention of going to the gym but they carry their gym bags. We play to models of life. We want to be that person. We want to be that executive because we feel in ourselves that is what success is. That is what I want. And to achieve it, I've got to look busy. Even if I'm not sometimes. Correct me if I'm wrong. But you'll ask sometimes to see people, and they say, yeah, 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 I'll just look for my diary. And they will give you an appointment three weeks in advance, although they're not doing anything that week. Because it would look really, really lame if you can give someone an appointment the following day. This means you're not important enough. It just means you're not doing enough in your life. It means you don't have that image. And we fall foul of this because we want to accomplish a certain image in our lives. We want to live a certain life. And, you know, with, with the, the bust recently of the financial market, that has gone down a little bit. But it will creep up again. Because people will fall back into that pattern. I was going through your convention book, which I, which I must say first, really well done, guys. So everyone who worked on it, brilliant. A lot of work into, went into it. Please make sure you read through it. Um, one, one quotation stuck out, and this is verbatim from the booklet, it's not me. It says, the good news is that it is not terribly difficult to understand what, one must, what, what, what must be done to beat busyness. The bad news, though, is that most people even the ones who know that they should do what they should do to overcome the obstacles still find it to be an enormous challenge to actually do something about the business of their lives. As a result, they remain overextended even to the point where relationship with God and spiritual growth become a low priority. Did I quote that properly? Right. And it really sums up what we're talking about here. It's a matter of prioritization. I'm busy, of course I'm busy. It's good. I, like, I personally like being busy. I like being busy. Um, I like the fact that I have a diverse ministry. I like the fact that I do different things. I like the fact that so many different things give me satisfaction. And spreading the message of God is intrinsic to all of that. And I love doing it. I love being busy. Anyone who knows me will tell you 
that it's just part of who I am. And so to be busy in the right way with the right priorities is not a bad thing. What is a bad thing, and it actually works, happens to me sometimes as well, is where that busyness could potentially take me away from God. You think, how could you possibly be taken away from God doing what you do? Very simple. And, and the fathers will know this. There is a distinction between serving, and I always like this passage, um, between serving the house of the Lord and serving the Lord of the house. Thank you. Between serving the house of the Lord and serving the Lord of the house. So what does that mean? It means, yeah, I can be really busy coming and speaking to you here and sitting with people and uh, advice and confessions and running around and having meetings and doing all the stuff which in its essence is very good. But I forget then that it's not about just the house of the Lord. It's not about just doing the work of God. It's about having a relationship with God in the first place and having a relationship with the Lord of the house. So busyness in itself is not bad. Actually, it's very good. Because it counters what we were saying yesterday. Because to be lazy and to be inactive and to be stagnant are very bad things. So to be busy at this stage of your lives is great. Because you have the energy, you have the mental capacity, you have the drive, you have the health to do it. So do it. But don't be so busy as to be taken away from God. I want to share a passage with you from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have honed for themselves cisterns. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I must have used this, this particular verse three or four times in the past two or three weeks. It just keeps coming up. Why? It's a matter of who we are and what satisfies us. What are we trying to do with our lives? On one side, God is there as a fountain of living waters giving us abundantly and wanting to provide for us. Saying, I can satisfy you. You don't just need your work to satisfy you. You don't just need anything in your life to satisfy you. I can satisfy you. And I will give you, I will give you living waters. And I always make this point of fountains. You know, the image we get with fountains is that it's fresh, it's beautiful, it's dynamic. It's active. It's constantly rejuvenated, renewed. That's why people use fountains as a feature. That's why people find fountains so beautiful. It's active. So there is God saying to us, I can be, I want to be your fountain of living waters. I want to be that. But there we go as his people and we suddenly make for ourselves cisterns. What's a cistern? A cistern is a vessel. A vessel that can't be self-replenishing. It can't fill itself. You've got to fill it. Right? And so what do we fill it with? It's, it's stagnant. You fill it with anything. Water, it sits there for a while. It becomes putrid, becomes stagnant, becomes bitter. It's no longer fresh. It's no longer living water. It's not a fountain. So the first sin that God speaks about here is that we have left Him the source of living waters, the fountain of living waters, and made for ourselves these vessels that we want to gather into. And that becomes putrid and stagnant. And these vessels, these cisterns, can be lots of things in our lives. Our work, our studies, our careers, our friendships, our social life. Sometimes when it's excessive, even our families, this cistern becomes that which I must fill to give me satisfaction. Right? And it's okay if I'm filling it with the right thing. 
but I don't always feel it's the right thing. So if that cistern for me becomes my work, then that's disastrous. Because it's not going to satisfy me. I have left the source of living waters to go to a vessel that can't fill itself and it will not satisfy me. So the first sin is that we have left God and created for ourselves these cisterns. What's the second sin? The second sin here is that they're not even just whole cisterns that you can fill up and have them maintain something. They're broken cisterns that can't hold water. It's like having a bottomless pit. Fill it as much as you want. You know, you can take this broken cistern and take it to the fountain of living waters and put it there and have it run, have it stand under this running water for the rest of your life and it will never be filled because it's broken. It's broken. It just seeps. And that's, that's what happens with our lives. These cisterns that we take for ourselves, that we even make for ourselves, become broken. No matter how much you fill them, no matter what you fill them with, no matter how much you put into them, they, they're never filled. They're never filled. You can fill them as much as you want, you can try to fill them as much as you want, but they're never ever filled. God doesn't want us to drink out of these cisterns because these cisterns, as I said, gather up stagnant water. We all walk a journey in this life. And this journey in itself becomes difficult at times. Book of Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 to 25. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they had come to Marah, they could not drink the water there because they were bitter. Therefore it was called Marah. And the people complained to Moses saying, What shall we drink? So he cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Okay, what does this have to do with anything? Simple. Well, simple for me anyway. I'll explain it to you. Hopefully it's simple for you after that. This journey that we're on becomes a desert. Right? No matter how successful or satisfying your work is, or your life is, it becomes a desert sometimes, because you will have dry patches where nothing satisfies you. Because when God created us, He created us, as I said yesterday, His image and His likeness. So therefore there are certain parts of us that can only be satisfied by and through Him. And if we don't have Him, they're never satisfied. So there will be times in our lives, as we're journeying through, that we will hit this wilderness. And we will become thirsty. And we will come to this source of water in Mara, which will be bitter. Now we have two options. Take Moses out of the equation for now. They have two options. You either drink the bitter water or you go thirsty. And therefore in our lives, if we keep carrying the metaphor over, as you're going through this life and you come to a dry patch in your life, we are very thirsty for God and you can't find God where you are, you have one of two options. You either continue to go thirsty, which depletes you, which weakens you, and which inevitably will kill you, because the distance, complete distance from God is death. Or we drink of the bitter water of this world. The bitter water that may initially taste okay, but has that aftertaste of bitterness. And there are lots of things we do that we know are bitter, but we drink them anyway. Our work ethics, our work practices, the kind of relationships we have, 
the kind of dealings we have, the kind of interactions we have. You know, I know that on a good day, when we look through our consciences, we don't want to do this stuff. But it's a bitterness we've become accustomed to. And once we drink from it, you think, well, I've got a bitter taste in my mouth anyway, I'll just keep drinking. And we keep being busy. And we think, okay, this is satisfying me, it's fine, it's okay. There'll come a day when I'll find sweet water. There'll come a day when I'll do things differently. And that day doesn't come. But God doesn't want us to drink out of that cistern. God doesn't want us to drink out of bitter vessels. God doesn't want us to drink bitter water. God wants to, us to drink out of the fountain of living waters that He Himself provides, that He Himself actually is. So what did He do? He said to Moses, take this tree, throw it into that water, and it became sweet. What tree are we talking about here? The tree of the cross. Our Lord coming into this world and giving Himself onto that tree of the cross meant that that tree became the tree that was thrown into the bitterness of this world to give us the sweetness of potential salvation. To change our view. To change our lives. To tell us that this wasn't it. And every morning when you wake up, and you put on your smart suit and you take your whatever bag it is you're carrying now and you go into the city and oh by the way did I forget that you put on these blinkers that horses wear but anyway put those on as well think this isn't it that is not what you're here for it's part of what you're here for, but it's not solely what you're here for. Please believe me, I am not countering what I said yesterday. Because what I said yesterday holds very true. You are called to be faithful in everything you do. You do in your career, in your studies, your family, everything. You are called to be a faithful steward. But being faithful means that you fulfill your talent in the right way, but at the same time, that you are faithful to your God and your Creator because He gave you those talents. You don't suddenly take this talent. Let's say you're a you're very smart, savvy, successful executive. Right? God gave you these talents. You don't suddenly take these talents and work away from God. He, this is, he, he, he gave you this. If you're a good... Um, doctor, financier, plumber, carpenter, whatever you are, whatever your career is, whatever your work is, whatever you do for a living, God gave you those skills and those talents. And so therefore you need to use them successfully for God and with God. We've talked about work and we've talked about lots of different things. That doesn't apply just to work though. Any of you here who does a church service or a church ministry and is strangled by it, like you are strangled by your work or even more because this is more justifiable because it's spiritual, suffer exactly the same things. Gospel of St. Luke chapter 10 verse 37 Now it happened, sorry, verse 38. Now it happened when they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him to her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted by much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, 
Martha. You are worried and troubled by many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which no one will take away from her. Being busy doesn't just apply to your work. It also applies to your service and even your families. You must be a faithful servant if you are serving. You must be a faithful member of your family because that is also entrusted to you and new to it. But do not do what Martha did. What did Martha do? What's the operative word in this passage? Distracted. Martha was distracted with much serving. We constantly envy people of the Bible. We think to ourselves, had we been there, we would never have left an opportunity with our Lord. We would have sat and learned from Him. We wouldn't have run around constantly or excessively. We just do that now because we don't see Him. But they were just as guilty as it 2,000 years ago as we are today. Imagine this. Mary had the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, God incarnate, sitting in her house. Now, back then, houses were not huge. They were small. So let's assume the house may have been the size of this stage. Christ and Mary were both within this area together but she was doing something else is, is that comprehensible she was doing something else and you think oh, how could she possibly do that what we have now that Mary didn't have however is Christ not only being in this area but Christ being inside us and with us constantly and yet we still leave him and are distracted by many things we're too busy even if it's not work even if it's not family commitments even if it's not friends it's our service it's our ministry it's our God work don't ever be distracted Work properly, work faithfully, work hard, be busy, but don't be distracted. Don't take your eye off the Lord, because once you do, you will fall. It's very difficult for us to be Mary as Mary in this scenario. Because also, I mean we must realize, and to, be, to be fair, to be honest, that Martha also, you know, had some right to say what she said. She's there, people were coming in and out of the house, Mary was sitting there and just doing nothing. Well, we think she was doing nothing. But Mary was, was being filled up. There would be other opportunities to work. There would be other chances to work. But there is only one time when our Lord was there. And I think, if I was the same as, if I was in Mary's position, I probably would have done the same thing. But that is the case when our Lord is only there once. But for us, He's always there. Which means we can get on with our work, we can work effectively and efficiently and faithfully, but at the same time, be with Him. Be with Him in our thoughts. Be with Him in our prayers. Spend time with Him on a daily basis. Don't let your work, don't let your careers, don't let your studies, don't let anything or anyone take you away from God for days, weeks, months, years at a time. Because then we get into that downward spiral, it's very difficult to pull up. It's a very bleak picture, isn't it? 
I'm sorry if I give you that impression. Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. We can't ignore that. We can't ignore that there is a way that leads to destruction. And that way is slippery. It's slippery. It really is. Once you put your foot on it, it is very, very difficult to take any sort of control of the situation. Once you put your foot on it, it's very difficult to stop yourself. What we do say to ourselves sometimes, however, is, okay, alright, that's fine, I'll, I'll do it but I'll do it for just long enough to be able then to stop. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. It consumes us. It consumes us. It sucks you straight into it. And then gives you no option. It's like being sucked into a tunnel and not being able to see you out. So work faithfully, but do not become consumed by it. Do not become consumed by your own busyness. Don't be consumed by your own distraction. But that's not where the passage ends. Because the passage in verse 14 goes on to say, But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way to lead that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So, that isn't the only option. There is still another option. There is a narrow gate. There is a narrow path. And it leads to life. And there are few who find it. Do you think, well, that's not really fair. Why would there be only few who find it? I mean, if God is just, if God is fair, then lots of people should be able to find it. Any ideas why only few will find it? Because only few seek it. We're made a promise by our Lord Jesus Christ that says, that if we seek, we will find. Don't read scripture in isolation. Read scripture altogether. We are promised, if you seek, you will find. And so by definition, the fact that only few find it, means that only few seek it. But if you do seek it, you will find it. So seek that narrow path. Seek that narrow gate. Seek life. Don't be distracted. Be busy, but don't be distracted. Don't deny your sense of loyalty to the one who gave you all you have. It's very easy for us to take credit for our own successes and then blame God for our failures. Don't be someone who denies what others have done for them. And don't be someone who denies what God himself has done for us. Know it is he who gives. Be busy with your lives, constructively, in a focused way. With your studies, with your work, with your families, with your service, with everything you do. Be a faithful steward, but don't let your busyness, the sin of busyness, take you away from God. Busyness that leads you to God 
or makes you travel with God can never be a sin. But busyness that takes you away from Him is most definitely a sin. And it is that slippery path, that wide, broad way that leads to destruction. Glory be to God forever.